Hi there, Graham Vincent, violin maker and musician. I thought I'd do a Q&A in a slightly different way this time. I mean, normally I, I just chat away to camera, but um, in all honesty, I, I find myself sitting there waving my arms around a little bit boring, so I think you probably do as well. So what I've done is I've just um, decided to sort of run a load of the, um, the video that I've taken recently in the workshop. Uh, and just have that in the background and it means I can actually have a chat about what I'm doing in that as well as answering questions from the um, from last week's Q&A so that's what I'm gonna do so hang on let me turn this in my head I've got my headphones on and I'm, all I can hear is deafening sort of extraction sounds from the video <laughs> okay so I'm in the workshop here a couple of days ago I'm actually sort of marking out um, the 15 inch viola that I'm uh, I've started work on I'm, uh, I'm marking out the back on the pear wood. Um, in running alongside this, the reason that the extraction is on is in the UV box right behind me uh, is the pair of um, American fiddles in chestnut that I've been making. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a chat about those in a minute. Okay, so diving straight in with questions um, on last week's Q&A. Uh, Brennan 985 thinking about the eight-string gamba Helen shared in the Facebook group Could you make an eight-string violin that works in the way a 12-string guitar works two G strings very close two D strings, etc Or would the strings bump into each other? Okay um, Right uh, first things first. That's that's a um, a Norwegian or well Scandinavian uh, hard anger fiddle rather than a uh, gamba and uh, the way that the the strings on that work is that you have four normal strings which you play and then you have at least four, sometimes four, sometimes six, sometimes more sympathetic strings which run uh, actually in a sort of channel underneath the fingerboard so you actually hollow out a little bit of the fingerboard and a little bit of the neck so those strings run through then there's like a, a second opening in the bridge lower down uh, and then they are attached to the to the normal tailpiece, and um, the uh, you, you don't so you don't actually bow those sympathetic strings. They do literally just resonate uh, because the bridge is moving. That that excites them. It gets them moving. So it sort of because they are tuned strings it has a completely different sound to something like a spring reverb I mean a spring reverb works in much the same kind of way um, you uh, you know you play your guitar or your violin into your amplifier that's it amplifies everything and then it, it feeds that signal into a spring which resonates and of course the, the springs are chosen so that they give a sort of a, an even resonance across all the frequency range whereas resonant strings are particularly chosen to be tuned so that they don't um, they don't resonate evenly they actually sort of amplify certain harmonics certain sounds um, so it gives it a, a really interesting kind of more like a sort of church reverb but but sort of coming and going on different notes it's they're quite an interesting sound I think most people will be most familiar with the sound of a hard anger from the uh, Lord of the Rings soundtrack beautiful uh, it, uh, absolutely wonderful it's worth actually sort of um worth looking one up on on spotify or something and, and just listening to them they're, they're great um so t back to your question because i realize i've gone off one of my usual uh, tangents um if you put two strings side by side if they were close then yes i think the the, the way that violin strings resonate or you know the envelope of movement so to speak I think there is a real danger that they would bash into each other. Um, secondly, of course, um, when you bow strings side by side, if you're doing double stopping, um, then you would only be playing one of the two strings. So, in practice, I, I think it. I think there are problems with that Bec because um, because you have to move the bow so much to actually sort of play different strings I think you'd find that half the time you were playing single strings and half the time you, you weren't you know you were playing two um, might be worth a go um, this is me just kind of just kind of thinking my way through this because you, you, I've only just seen your question you sent it in about an hour ago um, yeah interesting 
Okay. Uh, MJF1036. Uh, oh, well, it's not really a question. Um, just a comment, basically, about... Um, about. I mean, I was talking about my idea of, of what one should be aiming for with a finish, and I was saying how I didn't always go for perfection, but, but rather going for something which left things looking like how can I put it like it had the fingerprint of, of a human working on it so not bad not rough but with some form to it that makes sense yeah I'm on the uh, on the bandsaw now obviously just um, well at the moment just cutting up off cuts uh, but uh, lovely bit of um, pear wood this it's the I've, I've made the the customer that's having this viola I've, I've made her a, um, a violin in pear wood and she's uh, th this viola is is going to be sort of uh, to, to match that anyway moving back to the questions um, and very exciting for you with the folk music radio show yes it, it, um, it was great actually the the first one went out I'll leave a link to the mix cloud below um, yeah, it's fun. I mean, if you like listening to fiddle music, you might enjoy it. I absolutely, I felt, I, I think I say so on the program, I felt like a kid in a candy shop, to be honest, sort of just playing the sort of music I like. It was amazing. Um, right. AP Exploring 7639. Thank you for the re reply on the five string question. There are quite a few people in the US playing them for bluegrass music. I really want to make one at the moment, but I'm working on a mandolin. Yeah, I, you know what? The more I think about it, the more it's something that actually is getting onto my list of things to do. <laughs> um, so I might start by making myself one and um, just see how it goes from there. Really, um, you've got you've got decisions to make uh, about wh whether you keep the same spacing as a standard violin and actually make everything a lot wider, or whether you you sort of squeeze the spacing of the strings a bit so that the neck isn't that much wider than the standard one I think that would be that I would be tempted to go down that route and I think I would also put this the outer strings the G, you know the, the C as it would be and the E uh, a little bit closer to the edge than standard as well so squeeze it all in um, Monty Latham, 739. I really enjoyed this session. I like I like the song. A little less talk and a little more action. <laughs> well, hopefully, Monty, you'll enjoy uh, this one where you get to watch me mucking around in the workshop at the same time as hearing me um, whittering on. Um, Mason MP1889. I have a question for your next Q&A. What type of wood do you think should um, should work for the top plate of a violin. I'm asking this because I currently have some pieces of what I think might be base wood, which I bought because it said it was spruce, but I want just to see if it can work. Okay, um, I, I've said this many times, um, and I think in the the video that you you're watching in the background now, uh, in a minute I pick up um, a large piece of reclaimed western white pine. But I'm always guided by, is it fairly light? Because um, certainly for the front and, and generally for instruments, you, you don't want stuff that's too dense. You know, there are, yes, there are exceptions with uh, high wear areas like fingerboards and also with guitars where you, you, you do tend to go for denser woods for the back and sides. You know, I mean, rosewood is one of the best sort of guitar making woods, isn't it? Um, and certainly... Uh, uh, Andy Bishop, for example, um, who, who made this the, the oak back and sided violin that I had a look at. I mean, that was you know that's not really a wood that you'd necessarily recommend, but uh, it certainly worked. So um, yeah. So first thing, I tend personally to go for stuff that isn't overly dense. It's got to be structurally sound, uh, and that's very important for the front because obviously you've you've got a lot of weight from the bridge sort of forcing down onto the front you've also got you know th that delicate area around the f holes you know the, it, the front is quite vulnerable and it does need to be sound so you know it needs to be structurally sound it needs to look nice as well uh, i've said it many times and i really firmly believe this that uh, it's it's important that an instrument looks nice and then the biggest one the most important one as far as i'm concerned is it should sound like it wants to be part of a xylophone you know if you if you pick up this piece of wood and tap it 
it should ring. Now, lime and base wood are similar, but they're not the same. Lime wood, um, well, it, uh, I'm talking UK nomenclature here. In the UK, lime wood is a light wood that's often used for carving. Um, and I made two violins out of it because it did fulfill all of the um, criteria. I would say structurally it was kind of on the bottom edge of what's acceptable. Um, you know, it would, I wouldn't want to go any any softer than, than lime. I have a feeling though from what I remember of base wood as it's uh, generally referred to as is that it's not resonant. It's it's a bit dull. So whilst it, it might actually work in all respects. I have a feeling it would rob the sound and you're going to end up with something that's really disappointing sound wise so you know I'm not the one holding the particular piece of wood and it could be that the piece of wood you've got is a lot better than I'm imagining um, but but do hold it up and tap it and be completely honest I mean it wants to, literally wants to sound like it's ringing you know and if it doesn't then don't use it um, DIY dark matter. Well done, Graham, buddy. Looks like new. Ah, oh, this is about this violin. I'm sort of in the process of sort of um, rebuilding at the moment. No questions? Oh, come on, DIY dark matter. Um, yeah, we, we look forward to your questions. Jeff034. Could you do a video on cutting templates on your laser cutter, please? Yep, I will do. Um, I didn't think it was terribly interesting, but actually... Um, it is something I do find quite useful. Um, so yeah, I, I will do that. I mean, the way that I do them is because I used to work in architecture. I mean, I'm used to using AutoCAD. I'm, at the moment, I'm using something called uh, DraftSite, which is sort of a, a it, it's like an AutoCAD clone, really. Um, and I then export uh, drawings at one to one on PDF um, because I find that although theoretically Lightburn does import DXF files, it actually imports PDF files far more um, reliably, shall we say. And then I sort of run them from there. Um, yeah. Helen2274. Thanks for... Yeah, okay. Jim. Thanks, it was really interesting to see that process. Thank you. It looks amazing in the end. Thank you, thank you. Do you have a link to the recording of your show on this first hour? It was in Canada. Yes, I, I will. I'll put that up. Um, V-OE9ZR asks Wondering what it is to remove old varnish you are using to remove old varnish from the various parts. Okay, so again, this was the um, this was this instrument that I'm repairing the Czechoslovakian violin uh, that I'm rebuilding and it did have a fairly traditional sort of a spirit varnish on it so it responded quite well to um, alcohol so I use alcohol and I also use acetone um, not mixed together separately and you know there's this I mean acetone obviously nail varnish remover will will tackle a lot of things not you know real hard modern lacquers that you might get on some factory violins but um, for, for what I was doing I sort of mixed those two work perfectly um, Fireman 9143 since you mentioned you designed by eye would you be willing to share the measurements and ratios when you're done? Yes, absolutely for example, violin scales tend to be 92% of the body but violas tend to range from 90 to 92 neck to body stops ratios usually 2 to 3 on the violin but viola could be 2, .3, uh, 2 to 3 or 2.3 to 3 yes, indeed, absolutely right um, I, I will, I will um, I'll go through um, what I've done, as I say, I've um, I have already made a set of plans for this, but I I kind of think I will bef before I actually sort of start selling them uh, or start telling people how wonderful the plans are. I want to at least have made this uh, viola um, and be content that I got everything right on it, and make any adjustments to the plans. Uh, I would also say, you I know, mean, that that two point two, sorry two to three ratio for the. Uh, neck stop to body stop that's all very well but don't forget that most of these violins have had their necks changed from when they were originally designed so when they were designed that wasn't the case uh, so that is worth bearing in mind 
I think there used to be a lot more fluidity in, in these specifications than people uh, nowadays accept. But there we go. Um, okay, a question from WM Crash. So, when you make um, the front or back of a violin, you plane flat what would become the inside. Oop, got the dog barking. Stay there, right. You plane flat what would become the inside profile, uh, the outside, then profile the inside. On the inside, on the inside, you leave a small flat ledge for the ribs to sit on. What happens if that flat ledge is now out of flat caused by wood relaxing and moving as a result of all the wood removal? Do you address it? Or is a fully carved top or bottom flexible enough to conform to the rib garland? Or just glue and clamp it? Okay, it's an interesting question. Um, so, once you've got the what will become the inside face flat, you then mark up and cut down the edge thickness. So at that point, y you are committed to using that flat surface to join to the ribs because you don't have spare material to actually sort of adjust should there be any movement. But in all honesty, it is extremely rare for there to be any movement. So it's not a problem I've ever come across. Uh, and I don't think it is a general, uh, a general issue, really. But it's an interesting question. So anyway, what's going on on the screen? What am I up to? I seem to be, at the moment, I'm just sawing down um, ribs. Um, the grain direction, interestingly, on those ribs is going to be sort of slab sawn, so to speak. So it's, it's not the ideal grain orientation that you go for. Uh, there we are. seem very happy with my pile of ribs. Excellent. It's, um, I mean, fruit woods can be quite plain. Uh, but it, it has a sort of, um, it's got its own beauty, this wood, on a sort of a close-up kind of level. Uh, and certainly the sound of the, the violin I made with it was, was wonderful. So, um, you know, th there's that in its favour. Uh, yeah, nice, nicely figured um, maple neck going on it. Um, what next? Oh, okay. You know, I was talking about... Um, reclaimed western white pine so this is this is material this was this that's one one board i hope you can hear that ringing that's one board um from uh, an old uh, english bureau now that bureau was made in about 1850 1860 and and that was timber that was being imported from the states at the time so it's uh, american uh softwood but it's beautiful it's homogenous it's um it, it's structurally it's, it's lovely and uh, above all it's very ringy and i've made about five or six violins using it and they have all without fail been lovely sounding violins so i'm really looking forward to making this viola using using the same timber you see what a big piece of wood that is and that's just at the, you know, in, at that stage, that was being used just for the internal carcassing of stuff. Funnily enough, that bureau is the one that I got the uh, Spanish cedar from that I use for uh, my violin number 44. And I've got enough of it left to make myself at least one more violin as well from the Spanish cedar. Spanish cedar, of course, being the sort of cigar boxwood, so to speak. Right, so I got my laser cut template. Yeah, you can see on the on the on what is the left hand side of the of, of the board there. You can, oh, I'm just touching it there. There's the a mahogany uh, lipping applied, and this is me wondering at this point. I remember it now. I was wondering how close I can go to the edge with it any without any fear of running into pins holding the uh, the lipping on. I had a quick look and I couldn't see any, so I I just thought I'd take the risk. It was a bit of a risk because I've just put a new bandsaw blade in. I've got enough timber there, I think, for probably four violas, actually, just from that one that one particular board. And you can buy old brown furniture like this for, you know, like 30, 40, 50 pounds a pop at the moment. And it's yielded so much, um, so much timber. 
it's a lot cheaper than going out and buying wood, that's for sure. I wonder whether I should speed up the video at this point. I'm trying to think of interesting things to tell you about what I'm doing. I think it's fairly obvious what I'm doing. I probably will use that same um, western white pine for the blocks in that viola as well. And the uh, so the front, the base bar, the sound post, and the, and the blocks. Uh, the back and the sides will be the um, pear, and as I say, that rather nicely figured bit of um, maple for the neck. I've still got some of my standard. Um, purfling left so I'll use that but I am looking forward to the day when I do run out of my purfling and then I will have to start making my own part of me actually wants to um, just use one colour so not not have a sort of alternating dark light dark but just, just go for one broader dark line I think that might look quite interesting Yeah, I have got a circular saw and I have got cross-cut saws and so on, but I still like to cut most things out by hand. Especially um, one of my friends recently had rather a nasty accident on his circular saw, which um, a as a musician, obviously, it's, it's one of those things that absolutely terrifies you, is uh, you know, injuring your hand in the workshop. So clearly, um, with, my, with my work, I've got to be a little bit careful. Keeps you fit as well, <laughs> which is not a minor consideration as I'm approaching 60 very quickly. Also produces less dust in the workshop, which is, again, is uh, not a small consideration. When you see the amount of dust that all these machines and sanding machines and so on produce, I mean I know a lot of workshops nowadays have really fantastic sort of dust extraction but you kind of think it's gone through a stage where there wasn't so much dust in the atmosphere because everything was done by hand through the sort of 20th century where people had to start working in really dusty environments. Mind you, I bet if you were the uh, working in the saw pit underneath the boards that were being sawed by hand, that was a pretty dusty place to be. Well, this is not the world's most interesting bit of video there, is it? I wonder at what stage I remembered and moved the video camera. <laughs> I'm probably studying the piece I've just cut off and making sure that I'm happy with it, wondering if there's any any reason why I shouldn't use it. I seem to remember there was there's one nail hole in it um, which I will probably patch depending it doesn't it didn't go all the way through so it might be that it disappears in the carving. This isn't the most exciting bit of footage either. I mean, basically, I'm just sawing a rough shape out. So I think I'm going to call it a day there. Um, I hope I've answered uh, the questions as such the best I can. Um, any questions, obviously, leave them on this video and I'll get back to you. I'll put the, um, the link to the radio show just in case you're interested on this one. Uh, yeah, OK. Look up sales, folks. Take it easy. Cheers. Bye.